Hello, thank you very much. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time to tell you where I was in life. So um, God has picked out some very critical points of when I, at about the age of 13, I tried to redirect my life and run my own life without God in it. About that time, I started smoking. I was raised in a church, loved going to church, couldn't wait to get there. Singing those old hymnals, uh, the old rugged cross, uh, the lighthouse, amazing grace. I mean, but at that young age, I knew there was something there. I mean, just a, something there with a substance. And um, But at about the age of 13, I made a, could, uh, choice in my life that would alter the direction of my life for the next 35 to 40 years. I started smoking cigarettes. <clears throat> and um, that choice it was a fire on one end and a fool on the other. And, <laughs> and I really didn't realize what would happen to me in the years to come, but that cigarette led me away from Christ. I didn't want no more God in my life anymore. I didn't want to go to church anymore. I wanted to rebel and run my life. And doing, in doing so, it almost um, took me out. But from the cigarettes with no God, it went from cigarettes to marijuana. And from marijuana, it was now uh, alcohol. You know, now I want some alcohol. And it just, it was a domino effect in my life. And the further I ran, at least I thought I was running from God, I'm in a whirlpool now. And in this whirlpool, if any of y'all know, a whirlpool eventually will pull you down to where you're going. But I stayed at the top for a long time, maintaining my life, I thought, with no God. But at about, uh, at about uh, when I was a junior in high school, now here's a God that I was rebelling against and I was running from and I was sinning. I was a hardcore sinner now. But uh, my God and your God knows tomorrow. He knows next year. And on a Sunday afternoon, um, God placed two advanced paramedics at my house. And uh, that afternoon, um, I crashed my dirt bike about eight houses up. And I lie, lie motionless on the road and two of my friends ran down to the house and said, Jay's hurt, he's crashed his motorcycle. And they ran and I grabbed the keys to the station wagon and you know, they cradled me over to the hospital and when the doctors finally had me stable in the critical care unit, they came out and told my parents that we have your son stable. And um, he's in critical care, but we must tell you that he's got a 50-50 chance of making it to Monday. And then they paused a second and they, and they said, my mother told me, I don't remember nothing about that day, that um, they said if he makes it. But um, it's God had other plans for me, even though I was a rebellion. So now we're going to speed up a little bit. Um, I was into cocaine now, and in 1979, you know, a God that loves me so much, who I thought I was running from, was always right here with me. In 1979, um, we had a move in the storage company back then, and we had a shipment that needed to go to Memphis, Tennessee. And out of 12 drivers, everybody was there. My father looked at me and said, Jay, I want you to take this to Memphis. Well, from New Bern to Memphis, it's a thousand miles, so I had to leave on a Monday, uh, Wednesday. Arrived out there and took care of the business and came on in in the early morning hours of Sunday. And um, that afternoon when I rested up, I rode up to Jerry Wood's house, my best friend. And um, he told me that they'd done some, so he said, good cocaine last night. And I told him, Jerry, I'm glad I wasn't here. We were all using intravenously now back then. And um, about eight of us and uh, had a little click. And Jerry, on a Wednesday, he was admitted to the hospital. And my mother was working there and she went to go speak with Jerry. And he said that he had done some, or he ate some bad seafood at the beach and he was sick. Well, the next couple of days, six more of our clicks, my clicks, they were all admitted and quarantined off from the fourth floor of the hospital. And um, the only way you could go in was a body suit, but within two weeks, seven of my friends were gone because of using bad cocaine that killed me. And um, here I am, a hardcore sinner, y'all, but God put me a thousand miles away. He pulled me out and says, you're going to go there. And I was a thousand miles. If I had to been in Memphis, I'd have been right there and I'd have been number eight. But my God loved me so much and a hardcore sinner that I was. And so my life goes on. And uh, I met a beautiful woman, we got married, but we still, I was still running from God. I still had a void in me that I knew 
I knew I needed him, but I just couldn't. I felt like I had ran so far and so long that my God didn't want me back in that point. And I listened to the devil over and over and over again. And he always enticed me and I would go right back. Um, we eventually, Rose and I eventually separated. And um, we got divorced. And uh, I, I sped up a little bit. In 1994, I was really running hard now. I was running so hard that if y'all see these shoes that these children wear that they light up when they walk, well, I had an adult size. And I, and I ran so hard that my lights never went out. They say, whoop, there he goes. He's going to go get another fix. And sure enough, then I went into what they call the hood. And um, that night, uh, I became a victim of a violent crime. I, I was shot twice. And, and the first one went through my left arm right there, and it, the shot was so powerful, shooting from the passenger window, that it just blew my arm, it blew the window, window out, it just, my arm went out the window, and I had to take my right hand, and uh, I had to take my right hand and grab and lay it across my lap. And I grabbed the steering wheel, put it in reverse, and as I'm coming around, he's in front of me now, and he fires off another round, and it hit like dead center, if, if it had been two inches higher from the windshield cap, it would have hit me right here in my chest. And as I'm coming out and going around, he shoots the passenger side of the truck three times. And then I felt myself, I felt myself walk to the right. And I told myself, he got me again. And every time I took a breath, now I, I hate to say that, but it's um, every time I took a breath, I could hear the inside of my body gurgling. And I knew that bullet went in my back, and I knew it didn't come out. And so I drove myself to a police station. And um, I knocked on the door first. It's about 11 o'clock now at night. I went in about 10.45 on that Sunday. And um, I, I grabbed the doorknob, and it was locked. So I told myself, Jay, if you don't drive yourself to the hospital, you're going to die. Because I could see the blood running out of my arm, and I could feel it running down my back. And I knew I was going to bleed out if I didn't get some help. And as I got back on the highway, there was a truck coming at me, and this shone as bright as day inside this truck, and I could tell he was telling me to stop. But I told myself, oh God, he's got in this truck. If I stop, he's going to kill me because he thinks I can identify it. But I couldn't, and um, it happened so fast. And I pulled in 31st Street, and he pulled in right behind me, and I got out. I said, I've been shot. I've been shot. He said, I'm an off-duty EMT. Come have a seat on my truck. I'm here to help you. And I got on his truck, and he grabbed two dolls' bandages and put it around my arm and took my belt off. And then as he started to grab another one to lay me down, he said, oh, no, you're bleeding too bad. He said, let's go have a seat on your truck. And so I listened to him. I thought, man, I've been... You know, blood everywhere, but I listened to the man and he laid me down for, for the tourniquet on my back to try to slow the bleeding down. And he said, I'm going to call for help. And he runs around the corner and he comes right back. And I told myself, he didn't call for help. He didn't have enough time. You know, what did he do? Well, within minutes, he's asking all these questions. Where are you from? How long you lived here? Da, 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 da. And I can remember my head falling to the left and he, he snatches it back up and you got to keep talking to me, Jay. You can't do this. And within minutes, there was police cars everywhere. But then when the... Here he is parked right behind me, but when the ambulance drives up, this man that said he was an off-duty paramedic had just vanished. It's like he was never there. He was gone. About a year later, I read the book Angels by Billy Graham. And I went right back to that same night. And I, and I realized what had happened to me that night. I realized that an angel had just been there to administer me help to save my life. And here I was, a hardcore sinner, running from God just as fast as I could run. But he never left me. I'm the one that walked away or ran from him. And um, so now uh, I went back. I went right back to my old way. And about a year later, I went back to the same corner I got shot at. And I had a Bible laying on my seat, on the passenger seat. And I saw a man standing there with a 
flashy orangey reddish suit, three piece vested suit, hat, shoes, everything. Uh, we made a little nod to know, you know, to make a little deal. And he opened up my door and he said, one foot in and one foot out. He looked at me and said, what do you want? And I said, I want a 20. He looked down at that Bible and looked back up at me with one foot in my truck, one foot out, but wouldn't get in with that Bible on my seat. Second time he looked at the Bible and looked up at me and just stared at me and I'm sitting there thinking, man, come on, get in my truck, you know, I'm a white boy, black man, cop go by, popo, drug deal, you're going to get busted. But the third time he looked down at that Bible and he looked back up at me, it's like a force just overcame me and I reached over there and just grabbed that Bible and I just threw it in the back seat, just like it was a piece of trash. He got in and we rode around the corner, rode around, and I let him out parallel to where I picked him up at one block over. And he looked at me and he said, pretty boy, one foot in, one foot out. He looked at me and he said, pretty boy, what are you doing coming up here in my neighborhood buying my crap cocaine with that Bible laying on your seat? And went, <laughs> I drove the distance of about the pickup truck and I stopped and I got out and I looked everywhere around, very open area, and he was gone. Sometime later, I asked an ordained pastor, Grady Sims in Asheville, could the, Bible, could the devil touch the Bible? And he said, why do you ask? And I told him the story I just told y'all. And he started shaking his head, no. And I said, he can't touch it, can he, Grady? He said, no. And then he asked me, why did I move it? But yet the force that overcame me when he looked at me that third time, it's just like I was a puppet. And I threw it right in the back seat and didn't hesitate. You know, my life, and I was, Rose and I separated and in 99 she passed away from a, an overdose on Oxycontin after we were divorced. And, and I still continue to run. And, um, but every, in all my running, I never realized that you can't outrun God because God's love is everywhere. And so I guess I became like Forrest Gump. I guess that one day I just stopped running. And um, I turned around. It only takes, no matter how far you drifted off the path to Christ, it only takes one step to turn around and come back. And that's it. And um, so I turned around. I quit my running. I lived a very dark and cruel world for 35 to 40 years. And I lived it, I thought, without Christ. But Christ was always with me in every storm I ever put myself into. He always put wind in my cell and got me to the other side, although I didn't think he was there. Um, I mean, I could go on and on with where I was when I was detached from Christ, but I thought I was, but I never was, because he was always there with me and always carried me through every storm. Um, I don't know where any of y'all are in life today. I just know where I was. I'm, I'm not there anymore. I don't live that hell. I don't live that no smiles, no laughing, no joy, no tears. I'm a man that today I cry. Again, I couldn't cry because I was too full of hatred. All I wanted to do was just run and uh, run my life. But I realized that I can't run my life without God in it. So, folks, I don't know where y'all are, but it only takes one step to turn around. One step. And you can turn around and you'll be there waiting for you.